try to fill it out during class because I'm not sure what that much time is yet. So, um, uh, Themis, actually, you never pronounce the name. Uh, Themistopoulos? Themistopoulos here? No? Okay. Uh, does anyone want to tell me why uh, having trade brings benefit to people in a pure exchange economy? Yeah, go. It's illogically specialized. Well, so no one's producing here, right? So in a pure exchange economy, before there's any production, right, if people are just exchanging things, what's the logic for why it benefits people? Um, well, if they aren't already at their optimal position, then they predict it to, if they teach it to a higher degree, yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, Michael, do you want to put that in a little bit more intuitive terms? Oh, I was going to say it was like comparative advantage. Well, that's not true in a in a, a pure exchange economy. What, what do you think? Without trade, uh, you're limited to your endowment. Whereas if you can trade, your budget is kind of the this entire line instead of just. You guys are all too techie. Just just tell me the sim. I mean, just give me a simple. Re yeah, go ahead. You buy things differently. Yeah, some people like certain things. Other people like other things. If, some, if I, you have things that I like and I have things that you like, we can both be better off by me giving you the things that you like and you giving me the things that I like, right? And that's that's the basic logic. I mean, you can formalize it in all the ways you guys have been talking about, but that's the basic idea. Um, so trade allows us each to have more of what we value. Um, and a simple way to represent this was the Edgeworth box, right, which you guys were talking about. People have indifference curves between the different goods. They start with some endowment, and they can trade up to a higher indifference curve. And they'll trade, they'll always trade at a point <coughs> where their two indifference curves are tangent, because that's the point where they're both tangent to the prices at which they trade, right? And that's an optimal point, because uh, the, when their indifference curves are tangent to one another, there's no way that without moving me to a lower indifference curve, I can get you to a higher indifference curve, right? So I mean, that was just what you guys did last term. Now, um, uh, we know actually something more than that trade just brings benefits. And Yvette isn't here, but does anyone want to tell me what the wealth, fundamental welfare theorems in the context of an exchange economy say? Yeah. Um, I think it says that efficient equilibria um, are, well, sorry, equilibria are Pareto efficient, so that mm -hmm. when you have the equilibrium, you can't make someone better off without making someone better off. Yeah. And what, that's the first welfare theorem, and what is the second welfare theorem? I think the second one is that uh, Pareto efficient outcomes or situations yeah. under certain, certain circumstances are also efficient, or are out of equilibrium. Yeah. Everything that's Pareto efficient, anything you would ever want, is some equilibrium. It just requires redistributing resources in the right way. So. Um, and this just comes from the fact that at, in the Edgeworth box, right, everyone is tangent to one another at equilibrium. That says that everyone's marginal rate of substitution between any two goods has to be equal to everybody else's. And those are exactly the social conditions for optimization. And as a result, um, you know, any allocation we want to achieve can be achieved by the market. And any allocation achieved by the market is efficient. This is basically the classic Adam Smith invisible hand argument, right? Everyone following their own interests and taking the prices <coughs> as given uh, promotes the interests of the society as a whole. Um, and a lot of today, it, yeah, go ahead. Um, but these uh, welfare theorems are proven in the two people in the, in the yep. um, for uh, uh, a larger number of people. Um, would it still hold? Yeah, so I mean, basically, the, the things are proven for two people because you can put it into a stupid little box. But the, the basic idea of the stupid little box is just that everybody's <laughs> ratio of marginal utilities is equal to everybody else's because they're all equal to the ratio of the prices. And those are the general conditions for a general economy of um, efficiency. Right? And so those conditions will always hold because everyone is going to set their own marginal util ratio of marginal utilities to the ratio of prices. And uh, that's exactly what society wants to do is equate everyone's marginal rate of substitution. Because they want the amount of utility we get from any given person to be you know, the, the same across any two goods as it is for any other person. Right? Otherwise, there would be a way to make them both better off.
Um, now, I'm not going to go over the Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe economy that you guys looked at in the book. You can just follow it there. It's not going to really be central to the course, and I don't think you, you learned very much from it, actually. Um, but um, what I do want to talk about is um, the, the existence of equilibrium. So the book, I mean, uh, the existence of equilibrium depends or seems to depend, at least, on having these very smooth, uh, you know, demand functions and indifference curves and so forth. Because, you know, imagine that there was a kink in one of these indifference curves or there was a jump or something. How would they be tangent to one another? All, all that sort of stuff doesn't seem to, you know, really make very much sense. So I want to go through a, a particular example of that. Um, and this might... Uh, <coughs> This might seem like a technical problem, like it's not of very much economic interest, but you get these sorts of jumps or kinks or you know uh, lack of this smoothness anytime there's goods that are indivisible. And most goods in our economy are in fact indivisible. So like you know you can't buy one one thousandth or you know the square root of pi uh, houses, right? You can only buy you know one house or two houses or three houses. And you can only buy you know one or two or three cars. Uh, you um, the parts of the spectrum. Uh, this is a common problem. Uh, are pretty discrete. There's a certain amount of bandwidth you need in order to like transmit a message. So when the FCC is trying to sell off the spectrum, it can't just like you can buy however much spectrum you want. You have to buy like a chunk of spectrum, right? Um, so, in fact, most things are pretty indivisible. So you would think that this theory would be pretty irrelevant if, when, as soon as things get indivisible, it doesn't really work. So, to just give you an example of the problems that the theory has when there's not divisibilities, um, let's consider the example that was in your reading. So, there are two people and two goods. So, Charlie is the first person, and he views the two goods as perfect complements for one another and values each at one dollar. Sorry, values the two together at one dollar, right? Sonia um, has either or preferences. She wants one or the other, and when she has one, she doesn't care about getting the other, and she values getting at least one of them at 75 cents. Um, so there's no equilibrium in this economy, and Sungho, is Sungho here? No, Sungho is not here. Um, okay, does anyone want to try to explain why there's not an equilibrium in this situation? Ben? Because their uh, curves will never intersect because they never have the same marginal rate of substitution because they don't value the thing at the same price. So he would never, he would never, she would never sell it, he would never buy it. Again. Yeah, so tr take us through, like, imagine that the prices were. 75 cents for each of them, what would happen? Um, he would think he would try and buy two of them. Well, he wouldn't try to try and buy any because he'd have to get he'd have to get both of them. That would cost him a dollar fifty, right? Right. And uh, she would be just indifferent to having them or not, and so no one would end up with the goods, right? So she would only want one of them. He wouldn't want any, and there would be one left over. So that couldn't be the prices. So imagine we lower the prices. How about if they were, you know, 25 cents each? Well, then everybody's going to want them, and there's going to be excess demand. How about if they're 50 cents each? Well, that doesn't work either, because uh, she wants to buy one of them then, and he's going to want, he's going to be indifferent to buying one or not. And, you know, so you, there's, there's no way you can get an equilibrium in this economy. At any prices, either Charlie's not going to be willing to buy, or Sonia's going to be willing to just buy one of them and not buy the other, you know, or, she, yeah. And so there will always be excess demand or excess supply, and, and there's just no, there's no equilibrium. <coughs> Does that make sense to people? Okay. Now, um, yeah, so if either price is below 75 cents, Sonia will buy one, but not the other. And Charlie will only buy them together, and only if the total value is below a dollar. And the efficient thing is for Charlie to have both of them, right? Because the maximum utility Sonia can get is 75 cents. Charlie can get a utility of a dollar, so it's more efficient for him to have both of the goods. Uh, but that's not an equilibrium. Because any time he's willing to buy both of the goods, Sonia's willing to buy one of them, right? 
So um, the problem here is really not the um, fact that the goods are indivisible. The real problem is that there are only two people. And it's never reasonable to think of a market economy with only two people. Think about what Charlie would do. So imagine he had both of the goods. You know, it's not like he would probably hold on to them. But, you know, if he was going to sell them to Sonia, he would try to figure out what's the maximum I can get out of her. I'm going to try to figure out what price I should be charging. On the other hand, if Sonia started with the goods, she'd say, oh, Charlie values it at a dollar. Let me offer both of them to him at a dollar. I'm going to be better off than that. So, you know, as soon as you get away from, like, there being a large number of people who take prices as given, it's very easy to see that there would be something that could be worked out in this case, right? The only problem is coming from the fact that we're assuming people are price takers, which is totally unrealistic when there are only two people, right? Um, so, the, the, this, mo this situation is really more of a monopoly or duopoly situation or something like that, which we'll talk about in later lectures. But um, in order for something to be competitive, there should be um, many, many people, not just two, right? So um, let's now suppose that there's a continuum economy. That is, that there's a ton, a ton, a ton of people, but um, they're sort of similar to this. That is, there's 0.5 of people in society are like Charlie, 0.5 of people in society are like Sonia, and there's enough of each good to satisfy half of people, right? Um, now, Terence, could you tell me what the equilibrium looks like in this economy? In the reading, I think it says that half, <coughs> um, all, all the Sonias will be satisfied because they are willing to pay 75 cents yeah. for each, uh, for one or the other. Yeah. And Charlie's on all the Charlie's only willing to pay 50 cents yeah. for one or the other. So after all the Sonyas are happy, then uh, buying what they want to buy, half the Charlie's are going to come into the market. So only yeah. half the Charlie's will be satisfied, half the Charlie's will have none, and all the Sonyas will have bought a good. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. The, the one point to notice, though, is that half the Sonyas end up with good A, and half, half the Sonyas end up with good B. So, um, and the reason why that's efficient is pretty clear, which is, yeah, just as Terrence said, each Sony is willing to pay 75 cents sort of per good, whereas Charlie is really only willing to pay 50 cents per good, because he needs both of the goods in order to be happy, right? And so it makes a lot of sense to satisfy the Sonyas first. Now, the Charlies only like the package, so you want to satisfy the Sonyas equally from the two different goods so that you have as many packages to give to the Charlies. And so that's the efficient thing, but can that be an equilibrium? Well, yeah, it's very simple. So imagine that the price was 50 cents for each of them. Then Sonia would be indifferent between the two goods, but would definitely want one of them. So half of them would be happy taking one good, and half would be happy taking the other. And the Charlies at those prices would be indifferent between having the package and not having the package. And so half, half of them would be happy to take the package, and half of them would be happy not to take it. So that's an equilibrium. So um, now a natural question is, what happens when the prices are 0.5 and 0.5 in the finite economy? How come that's not an equilibrium there? David, what do you think? I think the, the prices of each good are 0.5 yeah. and 0.5. Um, what, what are the demands of each, each person at that point? But, I mean, Charlie will want two because he, he can afford two now. But, um, well, they're, but they're 50 cents each, right? So they yeah. add up to one dollar. Yeah, so he would get one of each. Well, but not necessarily, right? Because he's indifferent. You know, he'd be happy <laughs> to take nothing or to take both of them, right? Because at 50 cents each, those add up to one dollar, right? Well, the Sonyas are willing to pay more for one of them, but not for both of them. So they either want one of A and zero of B, or one of B and zero of A, right? So, okay, so what did we just say? We just said that the 